are grateful that we can come to you with needs like these. We feel often so helpless when we want to do something, we want to reach out. God, when we feel helpless, we thank you that you are the ever-present one, that we have an advocate with you in the heavens who ever lives to make intercession for us because his blood was shed for us. God, we pray that you will use the moments before us now, that in all things Christ would be honored, that you would be glorified, and that we as your people would be immensely helped and eternally benefited. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. The reading today will be from 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. It was the first day of last calendar year that we began 1 Peter. We finished it the last Sunday in November. And so we begin this evening with 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these, he has granted to us precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may be become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence, in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. And we here this evening are still able to call these things to mind because of Peter's efforts recording this letter. May God help us as we consider this text this evening and over the next several weeks and months as well. Some six weeks ago, we left off First Peter and I alluded to us beginning Second Peter before too long. And so here we are, though there was actually a few years between these two letters that Peter wrote, we took a few weeks and that will suffice for us as we pick up and continue looking together week after week at this letter that the fisherman Peter wrote to Christians in the mid-60s, 65 to 68 AD, different mid-60s. Some of you are more familiar with the mid-60s than the rest of us. So. <laughs> Peter's writing this letter with the goal of encouraging us to know Christ. He is encouraging us to become like him. That, that's the theme of the letter, especially here in the opening section of the letter. If you take some time this week and 
read through the entirety of the letter, you will see that Peter is encouraging these believers to prepare for the coming of Jesus. So not just these believers as the original recipients, but he's encouraging us to prepare for the coming of Jesus. Because on the one hand, it is very near. And on the other hand, it is so often forgotten that he is coming again. I want to only look at the first two verses together this evening, but I've split it into four points for us to use as pegs along the way. First, Peter, the bondservant and apostle, then recipient, or as Peter calls them, those people. Thirdly, faith received. And fourthly, grace and peace as the salutation or prayer that Peter offers. Peter, a bondservant and an apostle. Some of you will remember a year ago, I spent an entire sermon unpacking this man, Peter. I have shrunk that down to one point, actually four of my sub points from that some 20 point sermon. Just to remind us who this man is, understanding him helps us to not only identify with him, but realize the context from which he is writing originally. Peter was a fisherman and he was called by God to stop casting nets and to begin following Christ in order to become a fisher of men. One of the more familiar events from his life that we are acquainted with in the scriptures was him making that bold statement, you are the Christ. When Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And though Peter's faith was fledgling at best all along the way, after his denial of Jesus on the eve of the crucifixion, at the crucifixion, after the resurrection. Even then, Peter goes back fishing, back to what he was called from in the beginning. And Jesus, who doesn't give up on any of his own, goes out to Peter on the boat and reaffirms his calling. And we have that, again, very familiar passage of Simon Peter, do you love me? The threefold, do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. And we have evidence of that all throughout the book of Acts of Peter's care for Christ's people as he's preaching the gospel. All throughout Acts and First Peter that we looked at last year and now Second Peter, these are evidences of Peter responding affirmatively to the call of God on his life to serve them. Here, Peter calls himself a bondservant of Jesus Christ and an apostle of Jesus Christ. It's difficult to define exactly what a bondservant is, but the way that the apostle Paul uses it in Galatians 1.10 probably adds the most helpful concept or idea for us understanding it. Listen to what the apostle writes. For, I, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So someone who is a bondservant of Christ is someone who is an agent of the divine master, who is committed to serving him most of all, who has a right humility before the Lord. Peter says, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ, but he's not just a bondservant. He goes on and says, I'm an apostle. That is, I have been commissioned by God. That happened in John 21 that, we, that I referenced already with the do you love me passages. An apostle is someone who's commissioned by God. Peter was commissioned by God. He, he was a messenger that was chosen specifically by the Lord to, to be his representative in the early days of establishing the church. In fact, the apostles along with the prophets, according to the Paul's writing to Ephesus are the foundation of the church. Now, an apostle has no inherent authority, whether we're talking Peter, Paul, James, or John, they don't have inherent authority, but they have authority from God. It's the office that brings about the authority, the way that God has established apostleship to work, to be in the foundational aspect of establishing the church here on earth. I'm a bond slave, a bond servant. 
The humility of Peter is noted in him recognizing that he's a bondservant and noting it. But there's an authority expressed from Peter as well. I'm an apostle. In in one phrase, Peter is both identifying as the lowest level of society, that of a slave, as he held the most elevated office among Christians, that of an apostle. So the highest office bearer in the church still recognizes that he's a servant of Christ. That's this Peter, Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. It's no wonder that Peter would see himself this way and talk about himself this way. He had followed Christ for three years. The same Christ who said, the Son of Man didn't even come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And here's Peter seeking to follow the pattern of his Lord, being a bondservant and an apostle. So Peter, because he's an apostle, because he's a bondservant, because he's called of God, he had the right to tell those Christians, as he refers to them, and us here this evening, what we should believe and how we should live. He had the authority to tell them what they ought to believe and how they ought to live. And now we open the scriptures and read, yes, Peter penned it, but we understand that he's writing under the inspiration of God. It's God himself who's telling us what we ought to believe and how we ought to live. To those people, as well as to us. So that's Peter, our our author. And the recipients, the original recipients of this second letter of Peter. I mentioned already, Peter refers to them as those people. They're people of faith. Literally, he says, those who have faith. Those who have received a faith. He's writing to Christians, similar to 1 Peter. He's writing to Jews and Gentiles alike. They've been dispersed abroad. They're no longer living in their homelands. But here in this second letter, in contrast to the first letter, Peter is noting the inward reality of their faith. And only that. There's no mention of their geographical location or their providential circumstances. It's just simply this. They are people who have placed their faith in Jesus. And he's writing to them to encourage them about how they ought to believe and how they ought to live. There's less interest in location and more emphasis on spiritual possessions. This is where their identity lies. This is who they are in Christ. And Peter defines them that way. To those, which sounds very generic and not very specific and potentially even callous. Until you fill in the blanks. To those who have received faith. A faith of the same kind as ours. He's writing to to Christians, as I said. There are a number of similarities between these two books. And I trust that as we continue to work our way through it, we will see them. But I will mention them now for the sake of the argument. I doubt anyone in here is a part of higher criticism or you're trying to somehow convince yourself or you're arguing with yourself whether or not Peter wrote the letter. But the letters very much have some overlap and deal with similar things, which makes sense if the same author is going to do that, writing to the same people. With regard to the inspiration of the Old Testament, 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 10 through 12. When we come to 2 Peter, It's chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. Peter is emphasizing the divine inspiration of the Old Testament as he writes to these people, reminding them that all of the Bible is God's word and is relevant for their life. He talks about the doctrine of election, both in chapter 1, verse 2 of 1 Peter, verse 10 of chapter 1 in 2 Peter. The doctrine of the new birth, of regeneration. Chapter 1, verse 23 of 1 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 4 of 2 Peter. The necessity of the holiness of life. Chapter 2, 11 and 12 in 1 Peter. In 2 Peter, it's verses 5 through 9 of chapter 1. About the sinful angels being in prison or in hell. About Noah and his family being saved. About immorality and about judgment on immorality. And an exhortation to Christian living and a final doxology. We find all of these things in both letters from Peter. In 1 Peter, 
You'll remember that the recipients were facing hostility and social rejection because of their faith. And Peter wrote to them, reminding them that they ought to be holy because God is holy and that they have a pattern in Christ who is their example. In the midst of all the outside influences that they're dealing with, whether government or employees or spouse or persecution, persecutors or Satan, that they have a pattern in Christ and an expectation to be holy. But in Second Peter, he's not writing to a people who are being bothered and badgered by the same kinds of things. At least he doesn't reference them. They're dealing, on the other hand, with theological issues and moral heresies from false teachers that threaten the stability of the Christians within the churches. Among the Christians, there were theological and moral heresies creeping in through false teachers. And these will be detailed in the coming weeks as we continue to work through the letter together. So where the letter of 1 Peter focuses on hope, in view of present sufferings, Second Peter focuses on knowledge in view of present dangers. First Peter is addressed to suffering Christians. Second Peter is responding to false teachers. Primarily, it was eschatological skepticism. Primarily, they were denying the future coming of Christ. And if you deny the future coming of Christ, you also then deny the future judgment of Christ. And if there's no judgment for sin, then it opens the door for licentious living. So it leads to a rationalizing that grace releases us somehow from all ethical obligations. So when we read 1 Peter, we can see him dealing with these things, reminding them, no, we do have obligations to live holy lives. But the Christ who came and lived and died, he's coming again. And he will judge sin. Who are the false teachers? In chapter 2, verse 1, they reject Jesus Christ and his gospel. In verse 2, they lead others astray by their conduct, the conduct of their lives. In verse 10, they indulge in corruption and despise authority. Again in verse 10, they arrogantly revile angels. Verses 13 and 14, their lives are characterized by immorality. Verse 19, they teach freedom, but they themselves are enslaved to corruption. Into chapter 3, verse 4, false teachers ridicule Christ's return. In verses 5 through 7, they deny the promised coming judgment. In verse 16 of chapter 3, these false teachers distort the teaching of the scriptures by living in sin. So these are the recipients. These are the those, those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. So Peter is writing to these Christians. And let's look now, the third point at how he defines them. Those who have received a faith of the same kind. The King James, New King James says it so well, like precious faith. And that's included in that, the same kind, it's the same preciousness is included there in the original language. They received faith of the same kind as as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There, there's the, the unity, the singularity. It's the only distinguishing mark that Peter makes. Not some are from this region and some are from that region. Not some have this past and some have that past, but they have this in common, faith in Christ. Christ who is precious, 1 Peter 2, 4. That's the way that Peter referred to him. And here you may have noticed in verse 4, the promises that, this, that we have from this Christ are also precious. That is, they are valuable, beyond price. No, nothing's comparable to Christ and what he provides for us. The, the preciousness of this faith and of this one in whom our faith ought to be in, the value is greater than life itself itself. 
Peter's writing to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. Those who have received the same gift. The same gift for apostles, for Peter, for Paul, for James and for John. For these original recipients of this letter and for us. There's equality of dignity, dignity of what's offered in this gift of faith from God. There's equality of honor. As he makes us his own, there's equality of privileges. Peter had no access to the throne of God that we do not have. So Peter writes, encouraging these believers to be confident, encouraging us this evening to be confident of the full status that we have as God's children. Because, Peter will go on to say, there are false teachers that are sowing doubt. And Peter's saying, that's not true. Don't listen to them. Know what God's word has said and believe it. Be confident in your full status as his children. He's making a point here. You've received the same kind of faith as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior. God was then between Peter and the apostles and the original recipients of this letter and still is impartial with regard to the apostles, the original recipients and us in granting faith. God isn't partial. He doesn't favor the apostles. He doesn't favor the Jews or any certain group. He's impartial in giving the gift of faith. Measures may differ in degrees and or appropriations, but the value, the preciousness Peter makes abundantly clear. It's of the same kind. What a delight that we have the privilege of living by the same gift of faith that Peter himself had received. That Peter's original recipients had received. It's crucial for us to understand this and to live in light of it because this receiving of faith is the great beginning in the Christian life. It is the all-important foundation We do not move on in the Christian life apart from receiving this gift of faith from God. So it's crucial, terribly crucial, that we have this same kind of faith that Peter is referring to. It's important also because eventually we're going to get to verse 5 that says, Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in, in your faith or to your faith, supply moral excellence and Knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness and love. But faith is foundational. We must receive this gift of faith. We must have received it if we are then going to furnish it out and add these things to it and see any kind of maturation and being conformed to the image of Christ. This precious faith that is obtained As Peter tells us, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ's life, his obedience, Christ's death, his work on our behalf, his doing all that was right according to the law of God is what grants us faith. It's that righteousness that's credited to us. And here we see Peter pointing out the deity of Jesus. Look at that definite article, by the righteousness of God, which is also included in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He's our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is both God and Savior. And he has purchased faith Guaranteed that those who believe will be granted the faith to believe. The faith that they received was the gospel itself. The good news that Christ Jesus came to save sinners. When we receive faith, it's the gospel. We can hear the echoes of Peter being used by God to bring about the full inclusion of the Gentiles here. 
the same kind as ours. Here's Peter who had such a hard time grasping that in the beginning. The vision came down from heaven in Acts 15 to convince him of it. And he's still struggling with it when we see his interaction with Paul in Galatians. But now here he's confident. He's writing saying, all people everywhere. It's the same kind of faith. All believers from all places, all social classes, all ethnic backgrounds, they share in the same blessings from Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ undermines all of our artificial human divisions and distinctions. All of them. Peter is writing to comfort and encourage and to strengthen us in our battle for sanctification by saying, the faith that you've been given is the same faith that I was given. He's preparing them, instilling hope and encouragement in them. In, in, the, in 1 Peter, the struggle was from the outside, as I've mentioned already. Now Peter is concerned with the dangers that are looming within the church. The best way to diagnose and to treat problematic issues is at the foundation and faith is the foundation of our lives. And so that's why Peter opens his letter here. This is how we all begin the Christian life. By regeneration. God takes a heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh. He grants us, gifts us, with the twin gifts of faith and repentance. The reason that Peter phrases it as receiving faith is because it is a gift of God. And it's the beginning of Christianity. The, the only thing before regeneration is us in our lostness. But God comes down. He enters in. He brings light and reveals sin. And with that revelation is regeneration. And a turning from that sin and a turning to Christ and a trusting in him for forgiveness and for all things moving forward. Faith is from God. Peter says it again here. I've referenced it several times. This faith is by the righteousness of our God and by the righteousness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's received by his righteousness. He himself 1 Peter 2, 24, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. He is our righteousness. We live to him, seeking to do what is right, what he has revealed in his word. The faith received is rooted. Any faith, if you have faith, it is rooted in the righteousness of God. If you have faith, it is faith towards Christ. If your faith is in any other direction, there's a foundational flaw. Faith is towards Jesus. Faith's source is Jesus. And faith's object is Jesus. Not only that, faith delights in Jesus. Grasps him and holds him. And with this gift of faith... Included with it, it's not just some small package you open up and it's F-A-I-T-H, faith. But included with this gift is all that God provides in Christ. When God changes our hearts, regenerates our lives, and gives us faith and repentance, it is an absolute guarantee that justification in the courts of heaven will follow. It is an absolute truth that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Forgiveness of our sins flows freely. Adoption as sons and daughters happens. We are joined to the family of God and we grow in Christ likeness, maturing, being sanctified. And it is guaranteed that we will one day see him and be made like him. Glorification is absolute for everyone who has ever received this gift of faith. Christ, I mentioned, is the source. He's the delight of our souls. He's the object of our faith. And it's possible sometimes for us to get in this battle of 
Are we thankful or trusting in Christ or are we thankful and hoping in his blessings and benefits? It's, it's really a, a bad argument for us to try to make because we cannot separate him from his blessings. We can't separate faith from justification and no condemnation and forgiveness and adoption and maturation and glorification. He's the benefactor and with the benefactor comes benefits. They're inseparable. Who he is and what he's done for us are united together in him. And it's this faith that God has given to us, to those who have received a faith of the same kind, the original recipients and us, Ephesians 4, 5, there is only one faith. And yes, our faith may wax and wane, but it is secure still because its source and its object is Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Simon Peter a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, writing to those people, Christians, who have received faith, to us who have received faith of the same kind, the same value and preciousness that he and the other apostles had received. And they received it by the same means that we did, the righteousness of our God and of our Savior. And then verse 2. The salutation or prayer. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So if we were looking at a letter of Paul, it would take two or three or four chapters to kind of work through the, the objective doctrine in order to get to the, the practical living and the application portion. But with Peter... He opens up here with objective truth in verse 1, and in verse 2, he's right to the application, right to the expectation of living in light of the truth that he has proclaimed. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As I mentioned, the theme here from Peter is his concern with the life of the Christian. He's written for that purpose, to aid us in applying and appropriating faith in our lives. This, this faith, I should have mentioned this already, this faith that Peter is talking about is not just a list of truths. It is an experiential faith that is continuing to grasp and to hold and to fight to believe. And really the rest of the, the letter of Second Peter is encouraging us and helping us to appropriate the gift of faith that's been given us to live in light of who God is for us in Christ and what he's accomplished for us. So it's a big book of applications of how we ought to live because of the faith that we've been given. But the initial application, which is all that we'll look at this evening, the benefits of the gospel, grace and peace, and really, grace and peace on a broad scale provide for us a summary of all that we are granted in the gospel. It's hard to find any benefit that won't come under the big umbrella of grace and peace. And if we're honest with ourselves, why would we want anything other than grace and peace? Is that not enough for us as God's people? Grace to you in the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that constant, unchanging, undeserved favor from God. That's ours if we're his. The king's divine favor is towards his subjects. If we belong to Christ, his divine favor is towards us unconditionally, unquestionably, eternally, undeservedly, grace from on high and peace multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, this is not emotional tranquility, but real peace. That is peace from God as a result of reconciliation happening. We were once enemies of his and he's made us his friends. Peace has been granted. There's no longer enmity. It has been removed. Rather than running around like rebels who are created for his glory, but we refuse to honor and recognize that, honor him and recognize that, 
Now peace has been granted. Reconciliation has happened. The ransom has been paid. And we're no longer rebels, but children who have peace with him. These benefits of the gospel are measureless, boundless. The word that Peter uses here in verse 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. He's really praying this from the outset, asking that grace and peace would continue to be poured out incessantly from above. Now, it's incomprehensible to our finite minds how abstract qualities can be increased. But that's really what Peter is praying here. He's praying for multiplied, manifold grace and peace. But he doesn't just say grace and peace be multiplied to you. He tells us how we can stir up that manifold multiplication. The second part of verse 2, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. It's as if Peter's saying this, Get to know him. Get to know this Christ, this precious one. And grace will abound all the more. This knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ results in right living. In fact, the entire letter of 1 Peter has bookends that say as much. Here in chapter 1, verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Chapter 3, verse 18, may you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This knowledge is an experience of communion with him that promotes fellowship, fellowship with him. So as we grow in our relationship with Christ and in communion with him, we grow in grace and peace. There's a multiplication of grace and peace in our hearts and in our lives as we pursue him with our whole hearts. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Peter here is guarding us in the opening of his letter from two dangerous ruts. On the one hand, he's guarding us from a sterile faith. That is, Knowledge in our heads that never touches our hearts. That's not at all what Peter is encouraging when he's encouraging us to know God and Jesus. But on the other hand, he, he's guarding us from another rut. And we might call that a felt needs faith. If this is a sterile faith, this would be a felt needs faith. That is heart knowledge that never touches our heads. Knowledge of God is personal and relational because God is a person. And we relate to him in that way. So it is personal and relational, but it also involves intellectual content. It's not either or, but it's both and. And so Peter is writing to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. Offering grace and peace multiplied. in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So what do we do? We press on to know him. We seek to know him who lived and died in our stead. We press on to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. We press on and in with him. Peter is is very narrow in who he is writing this letter to. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. He's dealing with faith, as I mentioned, and it's foundational. So in closing, it makes sense that we consider the question with regard to our foundational faith. Have you received this faith? This precious faith whose source is Christ and whose object is Christ. Is he your delight? Are you reaching out in head and heart and grabbing a hold to him? What he has revealed about himself on the pages of his word. Friend, if you haven't 
come to Christ. Take hold of Him. He is willing. He is ready. He is able. Doubt no more. Don't listen to the lies within or the lies without. He will save you. He promised to save all those who come to Him. He promised to cast none out who come to Him. So come to Christ. And if you are in the narrow region that Peter is writing to, if you have received this faith from Christ, then I want to invite you to come to the table that we're going to observe in just a few moments. If your faith is in Jesus, it's because he saved you from your sins. So come and drink of the blood of the new covenant. Come and eat of the bread which represents his body that was broken for you. If you identify with Christ, then you're welcome to come to the table. If you identify with Christ's church, Christ's church, please come to the table and proclaim yet again his death until he comes. The gospel is at times preached with words. In a few moments, it'll be preached in picture, the picture of the broken body and the shed blood. And we come and take part of it. Receiving, as it were, him who lived and died in our stead. When the Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Corinth about observing the Lord's Supper or communion with one another, he made a point to note that we should mind or examine our hearts in the way and the fashion in which we come. Some there in the church had been coming and taking in an unworthy manner. So in the moments leading up to when we observe the supper in just a few minutes, it's an opportunity for us to examine our hearts, to, to mind our coming with regard to sin against God and against his people. I mentioned it, if you are not in Christ or you don't have this faith that you should come to Christ, you should go to Christ and not come to the table. The table is for those who have already put their faith and trust in Jesus. So the table is open to all believers, those who are trusting in Christ alone for the forgiveness of their sins and who have a meaningful relationship in good standing with a local church. Parents, we ask you to advise your children well. You know their hearts. You know them. Advise them to take it worthily or to abstain if that would be better. I'm going to pray, and as I'm praying, Abe will come and play instrumentally while we observe the supper, and the plates will be laid out. Let's just come down the middle two aisles and leave out the outside. It'll be a little bit congested right here in the middle, but it won't be too bad. We'll come, take and eat and drink here, and then return to our seats, continuing to worship Christ because of what he's done for us, in order that we might receive faith, in order that we might believe and turn from our sins and trust in him. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for providing it for us and granting us your spirit that we might understand it at least a little bit. God, we pray for greater understanding and greater application. God, give us grace to make room in our lives to live on these truths. God, we thank you for the gift of faith that comes through the righteousness of Christ our Lord. We thank you that you sent him and that he who knew no sin became sin for us in order that we might be robed in that very righteousness. And God, we confess that it doesn't feel like we're robed in that righteousness. 
But based on the faith that you've given us, God, we long to believe it. Help us of little faith to believe it even more, especially as we come and proclaim your death, remembering the work that you've done for us through your only begotten Son. God, give us faith to believe as we take and eat and drink. We thank you for the new covenant of Christ's blood that washes us from all our sin. In Christ's name, amen.